Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here, and welcome to Theme is Not Meeting. Um, and uh, here's a little more, more detail on uh, my career. Uh, I've been in the games industry for about 10 years now. Uh, I started as a co-designer and programmer on Civ 3, um, but probably my, my, the project that I probably was most deeply involved with was Civilization 4, which is one uh, I led from the beginning to the end, essentially, as project lead and lead designer. Um, I moved on to there to kind of work on Spore for the last year and a half, two years of the project. Um, and uh, I am now currently working at EA2D, which is uh, the browser-based game group inside of EA. Uh, I have been working on a little prototype for strategy games over the web at strategystation.com. Um, and I'm also working on an unannounced browser-based MMO. Um, and so let's get started. So. One of the questions I want to talk about today is, you know, who, decide what's, what a, who decides what a game is about? You know, it's kind of a, um, kind of a nebulous question. Um, you know, when you're in a store and you see a game on the shelf, uh, you know, it might be about, you see a picture of a soccer player or a picture of a space marine or a, a picture of a, you know, a Julius Caesar, for example, and you assume that that, makes, that means that is what the game is about. But that's not necessarily true. Um, you know, and... It's not just a question of player versus designer. You know, it's you know that's that's an important distinction because you know we'll see as I go forward about the differences between theme and mechanics. That you know, oftentimes the designer might want the uh, game to be about one thing, but the when the player is actively involved with the game, it actually turns out to be something else. Um, so, you know, to begin with, whenever there is a conflict, you know, the player is ultimately always right because they're the one actively involved with the game. But what I'm really talking about here today is a question of theme versus mechanics. You know, which one really defines the game? Um, and so before we dive into that, I want to talk about, you know, some sort of definitions, what I mean exactly by theme and mechanics. So mechanics are, you know, the rules of a game. Uh, you know, everything that uh, is, is mechanical about the process, everything that defines how you play the game. For example, in the game Risk, you know, the rules are define where you can place your armies, what happens when you attack someone's territory. Uh, the attacker rolls three dice, the defender rolls two dice, what happens if there's a tie. Um, and when you, when you conquer territories, you get a card. And when you have enough of these cards, you're able to turn them into more armies. You know, these are the mechanics of the game. They, you know, and also, very importantly, how does someone win the game? You know, in, in the classic version of Risk, you win by controlling the whole world. Um, Theme, however, is something different. Theme is essentially the skin of the game. How is it, how is it presented to the player? Uh, and Risk provides a good example because it's been skinned a number of different ways. You know, there's Star Wars Risk, there's Lord of the Rings Risk, uh, there's, you know, a, a number of other different versions. Um, and, you know, as a game designer, it's important to realize that even though the game is, these games are skinned, it's still essentially Risk underneath. Um, but from the consumer's point of view, the theme is very important. So if someone buys Star Wars Risk, that means that's because they care about Star Wars and they want an experience that somehow is true to that theme. Um, so, you know, it's, it's important that, that it delivers on that. Uh, here's another way to, to look at this question. Uh, Warcraft was a long-running RTS series, you know, Warcraft 1, 2, and 3. Um, and... It's kind of an open question. Which, which is the true descendant of Warcraft? Is it StarCraft or is it World of Warcraft? Uh, World of Warcraft exists in the same thematic world as Warcraft. It uses the same characters, has the same storylines, um, but it's actually a fundamentally different game from Warcraft, whereas StarCraft, in many ways, is Warcraft in space. You know, it's the same similar rules, similar mechanics, some important tweaks, but, um, you know, it is ultimately the same type of game. So, you know, it depends upon whether you're the type of person who leans more towards mechanics, more towards theme, depends how you would answer this question. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about Ticket to Ride because this provides a really great example of what happens when there's some dissonance between theme and mechanics. So Ticket to Ride is, you know, probably one of the greatest board games that came out over the last decade. Um, it's, a, it's a train game. Um, and, you know, over the course of the game, what you do is... You, know, you draw cards, and you use those cards to basically claim routes around the country. You know, a route from Chicago to St. Louis, or from New York to Boston, from Seattle to San Francisco. Uh, you know, you claim these routes. Once you have them, you own them. No one else can take them. Um, and the way you score points in the games is 
uh, you want to essentially create these super routes. So you see uh, over in the left, there's a route going from Seattle to New York that's worth uh, 22 points. So if you connect Seattle to Denver and Denver to Chicago and Chicago to New York, now you'll have 22 points. Uh, and also whoever creates the longest continuous route you know, anywhere on the map gets 10 points at the end of the game. Um, when the game finishes, you're out with all these points, you know, whoever is the most wins. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's just kind of a very simplified version of a long running tradition of train games um, where you're, you know, controlling, you're trying to monopolize different routes and, you know, cut out your competition and, you know, uh, control certain cities and certain areas before your, your opponents do. Now, if you open up the manual, uh, most, most board games in the very front of the manual, they have this little section where they talk about the theme. You know, they'll, they'll maybe tell a little story or they'll give a little detail about, you know, what the game's supposed to be about. And this is what the, uh, this, these are the first two paragraphs in the Ticket to Ride manual. Um, and it's, it's actually talking about uh, around the world in 80 days, about um, some friends coming together in an old club and trying to take off on a great adventure. And I won't read all of this, but I will read this important section. The objective is to see who could travel by rail to the most cities in North America in just seven days. So actually, this is not a game, uh, at least according to the designer, this is not a game about buying routes or building a rail empire. It's actually a game about traveling on, uh, traveling on the routes, being a passenger. Um, which is actually very different from the way most, uh, most uh, rail games are uh, described. But there's a problem here. The theme and the mechanics don't necessarily match up. For example, why do routes close up for other players when you buy them? You know, why is it if you, if you travel on a route, suddenly no one else can? And maybe even, even worse, why can routes be claimed in any order? If this is a game about traveling, it seems like your presence on the map should actually matter. You know, if you're trying to create... Uh, complete a, a trip from uh, New York to Seattle, why is it possible that you can go first go from Denver to Chicago, and then you can go from Denver to Seattle, and then you can go from New York to Chicago? You know, that, that doesn't, doesn't really make any sense. You know, that, that fits the theme of buying these piecemeal, so you, uh, you know, attach them together if you're a rail baron, but it doesn't really fit the idea of you're traveling around the U.S., you know, as an actual physical entity. Um, you know, furthermore, why would, you know, why would the longest matter if, you know, you can just string these routes together however you would like? And ultimately, at the end of the day, the real question is, what does it feel like for the player? What type of game do they feel like they're playing? And when you play Ticket to Ride, you feel like you're playing one of these games, which is, you know, these are uh, some of the greatest in the sort of the classic line of uh, board rail games, where you are, you know, transporting cargo and you're, you're claiming routes and you're, you're controlling cities and you're trying to, you know, trying to monopolize a certain area. Um, Ticket to Ride is, is, is essentially a stripped down version of these type of games, but for some reason they decide to give it a very different theme. Um, and, you know, it leads to this, this weird question, who decides what's the game about? Most people who play Ticket to Ride, if you ask them what the game is about, they'll think that they're a rail baron. You know, are they, are they wrong just because the rules state, state differently, or are they right because that's the game they feel like they're playing? You know, who decides what a game is about? But I want to I go beyond that. I don't want to just say who. I want to talk about what. And this is, this is a point I'll be bringing up, you know, constantly throughout this lecture, which is a game's mechanics give it meaning. It, it fundamentally does not matter how you theme a game. The mechanics determine what the game is actually about. Um, and... I want to talk, go back to risk for a second because I think there's an uh, interesting sort of controlled example we have here um, when we compare these two classic world conquest games, risk and diplomacy. Um, and it's an interesting example because many of these elements of these two games are very, very similar. Uh, in fact, if you were just um, to see two different groups of people playing the game, you might think they're actually playing the same game. You know, they have so many shared elements. The games are both about world conquest. They're both territorial control games. You know, one, one person controls Brazil. You know, one, person's con one person controls Spain. You know, and they have just their armies in there, and you try to take control of those uh, spaces from someone else. Uh, it's a game about army tokens. Uh, you know, you have these discrete co tokens on the map that you start, you know, spreading around the world. Um, you know, there are, there are sort of small differences, but these, these high-level uh, concepts are, are very much the same. But there's a couple key differences. One is that Risk has sequential turns, which means that if I'm playing with three people, when it's my turn, I'm the only one playing. 
I do whatever I want to on the map until my turn's over. Then it goes to player B, then it goes to player C, and then it comes back to me. And when, when it's one player's turn, they're the king of the world. They're the only person who's deciding what happens. Diplomacy, however, has simultaneous turns. And you see the, uh, the, the person here in, in the photo, what he's doing is he's writing down his turns on a piece of paper. Um, so, you know, the seven, the seven countries in diplomacy, they each write down what they're going to do with all their units, and then they all submit it together uh, to the sort of the game master, who then figures out, okay, this is what everyone wanted to do, what actually happens, you know, because sometimes certain orders can conflict if both people are trying to move into the same territories. Um, which leads to a much different feel for the game um, because it's in diplomacy, it's much more about mystery, trying to guess what everyone else is going to do. In Risk, you see up front what everyone's going to do. Uh, similarly, here's a, another very different mechanic. Risk is probabilistic combat. It's the standard attacker rolls three dice, defender rolls two dice, and then you see what happens. Um, and everyone who's played Risk has seen situations where things have gone much differently than what they've expected. Um, where the defender just keeps rolling six over and over and over again, and it doesn't matter. Diplomacy, however, has deterministic combat, which means that every single situation that you could um, create uh, in terms of who attacks who and who supports who and who transports who from you know, this, this area to this area uh, is handled somehow in the rules deterministically, where there will be one specific outcome. Either neither army gets the space, or one army gets the space, or someone has to retreat, or so on and so forth. But there's absolutely no, there's no luck whatsoever. Um, everything is completely deterministic. Um, and so, let me jump back here. So these two things, the simultaneous versus sequential turns, and deterministic probabilistic combat, fundamentally change what these games are about, what their meaning is, which is, you know, to put simply, you know, risk is about risk, and diplomacy is about diplomacy, you know? <laughs> um, people who did play diplomacy get very into it. In fact, many people say it's, it's a game best played with people you don't know, because you don't want to, you know, ruin any friendships when you have to stab someone in the back. Um, and, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's a great, great game. It was said to be the, uh, the favorite game of, of people like President Kennedy, uh, Henry Kissinger, um, because it really, it really gave it such a, a true feeling of, of diplomacy. Um, risk, of course, is, is also about risk. And interestingly, there's been a revision of the risk rules that came out, uh, I think, about a year ago, uh, which really doubled down on this and made this a game much more about risk. They changed the victory conditions for the game, so instead of being about controlling every territory on the map, it's about achieving a certain objectives. And these objectives might be control all of Europe or capture two enemy capitals or conquer you know, six territories in one turn. Um, and the interesting thing about that is as you start playing the game, you know, it, it feels a little different and you realize the, whole, the way you win is by achieving these objectives. So you want to focus as much as you can on achieving these objectives so you're willing to extend yourself in a way you wouldn't previously have done in Risk so that you know, okay, if I just attack these couple extra places, maybe I can get Europe. And I know I'll be very weak after this turn, but it doesn't matter because I got this objective. So you're willing to take risks that you weren't willing to take before. Um, so they understood that that was the core, you know, fantasy of risk. And, you know, they pushed the mechanics in that direction, which was, you know, very, very smart of them. Um, so now I want to talk about Spore a little bit. Um, you know, if I ask the question, what is Spore about? You know, I might get some, some different answers. Um, and one of the answers that a lot of people would have said, especially in the days leading up to the release of the game, is, um, is, it, about, is it about evolution. You know, this was how it was sold often to, um, to the press, uh, to academics, to fans. You know, this is a game about you know, developing a, a single cellular life you know, in, a, in a tide pool or you know, whatever. You, know, you, you evolve it, you grow it, eventually it leaves the ocean. Uh, becomes a creature, uh, you know, it keeps evolving from, from there, you know, get you know, new limbs, a new, uh, uh, new, new mouse, new ways of moving, new ways of, of uh, interacting with your environment. And this is essentially what you're playing the game. You're, de you're developing a creature, you're evolving a creature. Um, however, um, I want to show you this page here. This is the Sporpedia online. Uh, this is a, the, the, the uh, 15 most popular creatures you know, as of a, a few months ago that you could find on that page. Um, and what you see here is uh, a diversity of creatures that are created by the users because Spore 
um, had a very, very powerful creature editor inside the game where you could create you know, just a remarkable diversity of, of creatures that was you know, a, a true sign to the uh, user's creativity. And you'll see, you see here Darwin, Obama, uh, Jesus. Uh, you see a variety of musical instruments. There's a puppet master, um, some you know, crazy fantastical creatures. And you know, what that leads, the road that leads down to is that Spore was really a game about creativity. Um, it was a game about unlocking the creativity of the users. Um, you know, it's, you know, evolution was maybe a, a backdrop for the game, but the reason people enjoyed playing the game was to either express their own creativity or to view the creativity of other players because the uh, creatures other people designed would show up in your game, and especially ones that were uh, particularly interesting or beautiful or remarkable, um, you know, would be rated up. You see them more often. You know, they, it, it was a game about uh, unlocking creativity and displaying it. Um, which leads to another question. Is there a game out there today which is actually about evolution? You know, Spore was sort of thematically about evolution, but what, what game is fundamentally about evolution at a mechanical level? Um, actually, there are, there, are, there are a number, and I'll show you one that may be the most popular, uh, which is World of Warcraft. Um, and people play the game may know what I, where I'm getting at when I say this is a game about evolution. Um, this is what I call Paladin Natural Selection. Um, which is that uh, over time, uh, people who, who play WoW have developed what they call builds, which are the concept that uh, you, know, you have very cl various classes in the game, and you have various different things you try to do in the game. You may be playing, playing a lot of player versus player, you may be doing a lot of player versus enemy, and moreover, you may have a specific role that you like to fill in your guild. You might be focused on healing, focused on tanking, focused on damage. Um, and for each one of these roles, there are kind of these specialized builds that the community has learned over time as they've explored the rules and mechanics of the game. And so, you know, if you go to WoW Wiki, you know, you can, you can find these builds. You can find out, you know, what are these sort of specialized ways to develop a paladin so they're very good at these things, which, of course, you know, is really not very far removed from, you know, Darwin and his finches. So, so you know, once again, you know, a game's mechanics give it meaning. You know, the mechanics of WoW make it a game about evolution. Um, Game over. You know, Super Super Mario Brothers. You know, is actually a game about timing. You know, obviously it's not a game about plumbing. You know, uh, the original Mario Brothers. You know, at least started in a sewer. But you know, obviously over time, they, you know, there was there was very little reason for them to maintain. You know, whatever the fiction of a you know a jumping plumber is. Um, you know, and they just you know focused on focused on the timing, the jumping, the exploration. You know, that's 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 the fun part of the game. Peggle. You know, is. <laughs> is a game about chaos theory, you know, not actually about unicorns or, you know, whatever else craziness is going on in the backward background in, in Peggle. You know, you know, chaos theory is about, you know, very small changes making a huge difference. You know, the classic example of chaos theory is you're standing on, you know, the roof of a house and you drop a ball and it might go left, it might go right, it's hard to say, um, but it'll end up in a very different place. You know, that's, that's what Peggle's about. You know, if you, you change that shot just a tiny bit, that ball is going to bounce, you know, in a much different direction, hit this pin and then go there and there, there and it's going to be very hard to predict what's going to happen. So it's kind of like an object lesson in chaos theory. You know, Battlefield 2 is not, you know, not really about modern combat. It's about teamwork. It's about being on a team that works really well together to, you know, capture points, to keep them, to, you know, attack your enemies well, to stick together. You know, one guy's, you know, driving the tank. Another, another guy's on top shooting down uh, enemy soldiers. Uh, you, know, that's, you know, that's ultimately what the game is about. Um, Left 4 Dead, similarly, is not actually about zombies. It's a game about teamwork. And this shows an interesting point where you can have two games with very different themes, which are actually really fundamentally about the same thing. Um, and the designers of Left 4 Dead, you know, they, they really thought through this in issue very carefully. So, um, you know, one of the reasons they used zombies was is it gave them a, lo a, a great deal of, the of thematic license to come up with interesting mechanics to emphasize the fact that the game should be about teamwork. Uh, there are all these special zombies that show up in the game. There is, for example, the hunter, who is someone who will sort of uh, pin down uh, one of the player characters. And, uh, first, I should also, always, also say that for people not familiar with Left 4 Dead, it's a game you play in a team of four people, you know, hopefully four, four humans, uh, taking on a you know, massive wave of zombies. Um, and they have some special characters like the hunter who traps a player character. Um, and the purpose of that special zombie is to punish loners. It's to punish characters who kind of just, uh, players who just kind of wander away from the pack. 
uh, because if they get trapped by a hunter, uh, there's no way that they're going to be able to survive unless their friends can come and you know, shoot, shoot the uh, hunter off of him. There's the tank, which is a huge, powerful uh, zombie, which no one player can knock down themselves, that kind of lumbers along, and if it gets to you, you're in trump trouble. So the tank requires concentrated fire. It requires you know, three or four players to be you know, firing at that one tank all at the same time. Uh, there's a character called a witch, which is you know, probably the, the worst, most powerful zombie in the game, but is most of the time is asleep or in sort of this uh, trance state. Um, and that requires the team to have close communication because if someone just kind of like starts running by as the witch and starts firing their gun, uh, the witch is going to wake up and you're going to be in big trouble. So it, it, you know, it really forces people to communicate and say, oh, the witch is there, you guys got to be quiet, you know, don't, don't shoot, let's make sure we get past this. Um, so the, you know, Left 4 Dead provides a really good example of how uh, you know, the team focused on finding good mechanics that supported what they wanted the game to be really about, which is teamwork. XCOM is a game that is not really about aliens, but about limited information. Uh, it's a tactical uh, turn-based shooter where you're, um, you know, you're, you're controlling a, a military squad, you know, trying to fight back an alien invasion. Um, and when you start, the most of the map is black, and you're often in sort of a like a cornfield at night somewhere in Kansas, that type of thing. And you know there's aliens around you and you don't know where they are. And that the game is about trying to figure out what's the best thing to do when you don't know where your enemy is. Um, Gears of War is also not about aliens. It's actually about cover. Uh, the game had a very important cover mechanic, which is there's a lot of shooters where, you know, you're just supposed to start, you know, running towards the bad guys, shooting them as fast as you can, uh, circle strafing, jumping, doing all sorts of kind of crazy tactics uh, were, you know, what's what the best way to, to win. Uh, what Gears of War did is said, okay, um, you know, you want to play this game like, you know, people in the real military play, where you, um, you use, use cover. You use a wall, you use a, a burned-down car, you use a mound. Uh, you slam into this thing, and then you shoot, uh, you shoot past it to try to take out the bad guys. And you, and you sort of jump from cover point to cover point. Um, so, you know, that was, that was what this game was essentially about. StarCraft, you know, also nominally about aliens, but really about asymmetry. The thing that made StarCraft important was it had three very distinct races. And um, there was the humans, the, the, uh, the Protoss, and the Zerg. Um, and uh, each of these races, it's, it's not just that they were kind of had three different art styles and had small variations. These were very fundamentally different uh, races to play. Um, and they also matched with uh, sort of, it's, it's a real-time strategy game, and it matched with an important sort of um, game mechanic paradigm in uh, real-time strategy games, which is that these games, there's kind of three different ways to play these games. There are players who rush, which means that when, when they play the game, they focus on trying to attack an enemy, their, their enemies as soon as possible. There's players who boom, which is that they focus on the economy so that far later on in the game, they'll win because they, they produce so much money that they can build an overwhelming force. And then there is a uh, turtler, which is someone who focuses on defense and says, okay, I'm just going to build all the turrets I can, all the bunkers. If you come for me, you're going to die. And the thing that makes these, things, these three play styles important is it forms a sort of a rock, paper, scissors triangle where you know, if someone rushes a, tur a turtler, they're going to die because the defense is going to be too powerful. But if someone rushes a boomer, they're going to win because the boomer is focusing all their efforts into economy. And StarCraft was about that asymmetry of roles because the three races match up with the three different playing styles. Zerg are, uh, Zerg's rush, uh, Terran's turtle, and Protoss' boom. Um, and you know, they, they just tried to find a thematic world that, that fit those, you know, those three styles. Um, you know, Galaga is, is a game of pattern matching. It's about, you know, expecting, you know, where, you know, how are the, uh, the aliens going to come this time? Is it to the left, the right? Are they going to circle? Uh, you know, what, what's the gaps going to be between them? And the reason why I'm, I keep uh, hitting on this is, you know, why are there so many alien-themed games? You know, this is something you see all throughout uh, the history of game development. Um, and the answer is it's easy to map mechanics onto. Right. Oftentimes when you choose uh, real world themes, you hit certain limitations because people come to the game with expectations for how something works. And civilization, you know, you always have you often have this problem. Archer should be this, catapult should be this, writing means this, the pyramids means this. Um, it's it's a, sort of a blessing and a curse. And this is why a lot of uh, game developers just decide to go sci fi because you know they can kind of twist twist the game thematically all they want to support the mechanics. Um, and, you know, here is sort of the classic example. 
Um, Alpha, Alpha Centauri is basically a sci-fi skin version of civilization. Um, and you can see that it was, they were able to carry over quite a few of the mechanics you know, on a one-to-one -one basis from the historical uh, world into the uh, future one, where barbarians become mind worms, spies become pro probe teams, and so on. Um, and then, when, once they were in that world, they were able to add in new mechanics that you know, didn't, didn't exist in the previous Civilization games just because they had the freedom of sci-fi. So what I want to talk about now is you know, what happens when a game's mechanics doesn't match its theme, uh, because you know, this, this can lead to problems. You know, and here's a you know, here's a, a big question. You know, what is what is Bioshock about? You know, this is a, a very interesting shooter that came out a few years ago, and one of the sort of important um, one of the sort of important questions that it was trying to raise was a, a, a moral one. You know, which is something you don't see in a lot of mainstream uh, games. And there are these little sisters that you find throughout. There, the game exists in this underwater city, and it's full of these little sister characters, which uh, it's, it's kind of beyond the scope of lecture going all the backstory. But basically, when you discover them, you have a choice of do you want to harvest them or rescue them? The game has this uh, genetic currency called Adam, which you use to increase your abilities. And if you harvest the uh, little sisters, you kill them, but you get a whole lot of Adam. If you rescue them, you get a little bit of Adam, but you get you know warm, fuzzy feelings knowing that they're not dead, and you rescue them, and they're going to, you know, uh, you know, maybe you know, live on to uh, a better life. Um, so, you know, the designers are trying to put the the player in uh, a position where they had to make a tough choice. You know, they, do they want to reward themselves as a player, or do they want to reward these uh, help these little creatures here in the game? Um, the problem is um, that that's not really true. Not at least not according to the game mechanics. Uh, what this graph here is is shows the difference between if you play through the game. Um, rescuing every little sister or harvesting every little sister. You know, right off the bat, you know, the people who, uh, the people who harvest get about 100% more Adam. But as the game goes on, the, there are other mechanics in the game that re reward people who rescue uh, the little sisters. So like, oh, you were nice, you were rescued, we're going to give you this little gift. Um, and we'll give you another little gift. And a lot of games do this, where they give you this choice of like a, a good thing and a bad thing. And um, people take the, the good route and uh, the game's like, oh, congrats, uh, we're glad you paid for good route. We, we weren't really going to actually punish you for taking this route because you did the right thing. Um, and the problem is, uh, is this, is players see right through this. They realize the mechanics aren't actually supporting the story. Um, but this is, this is a point I borrowed from uh, uh, some of Jonathan Blow's talks, and this is something he goes on about a lot. You know, what happens when your, your story says one thing, but the mechanics say says, you know, the opposite? You know, which one speaks louder to the player? Um, and when people, people are playing a game, when they're really into it, you know, they care about the rules. They care about the mechanics. These are the things that really are going to speak the loudest to them. Um, you know, so once again, you know, who decides what, what is a game is about? You know, what about spore? You know, was there, you know, was there a problem there between, you know, the, you know, the theme of evolution and the you know, actual mechanics of the game? Um, so here is... Here's a quote from Science Magazine right after uh, Spore came out. Um, I've been playing Spore with a team of scientists grading the game on each of its scientific themes. When it comes to biology, and particularly evolution, Spore failed miserably. According to the scientists, the problem isn't just that Spore dumbs down the science or gets a few things wrong. It means it, it's meant to be a game after all. But rather, it gets most of biology badly, need, needlessly, and often bizarrely wrong. So, you know, this is someone who was very unhappy with how Spore turned out. And that's because, you know, it had been sold about a game that was really about evolution. It was going to give us something meaningful about that topic. Um, and, in fact, they realized not only was it not giving you something meaningful about the topic, it was oftentimes, you know, actually going off in the, in the opposite, completely opposite direction. Um, and for someone who bought into the promise of the theme, that was a problem. You know, and this is, this is the simplest way to sum it up here. You know, Spore's theme was evolution, but its meaning was creativity. Um, which leads to this really weird issue. You know, this was kind of a, you know, the, the internal running joke on the Maxis team, you know, is, is Spore really about intelligent design, right? Because it had this creature creator, and, you know, you were doing whatever you wanted to with creatures, and that's really kind of the opposite of, of how evolution works. 
Um, so, you know, what about civilization? Um, civilization uh, is something that maybe has excited educators a lot more because it really does deliver deliver the goods in you know in teaching people about all these different periods of history and different characters and uh, different technologies and so on. Um, but Civ also has a problem. You know, the the theme of Civ is world history, but the mechanics, you know, the meaning of the game is actually be God King. You know, the, as the player plays the game, you are this you know character who sees all, controls all. You can never can never lose power. You know, you're, the game is all about you. Uh, the Sid, also, uh, Sid often summed up the game as it's good to be the king. You know, that was where that was where Civ came from. And this leads to you know what I would call the agency problem. Um, in order for Civ to work, um, there there were certain core elements that had to be true. One is that consequences in the game needed to be fair and clear. You need to know what exactly happens when you build a mine on this tile. Uh, when you research this technology, it was supposed to mean a specific thing. Um, and uh, also, you know, you can only have top-down decision-making, um, which means that, you know, who are, the player is in control. The player is the only one who's deciding what happens uh, in their civilization. You know, what you research, what the cities build, where the military units go, everything. Um, in fact, the, 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 the player themselves even decides when your country is going to have a revolution. So, you know, your people may not like you. Well, too bad. There's not going to be a revolution until I decide it. Um, and this led to the, this problem that our, um, our fan community determined the eternal, China, the eternal China syndrome, which is that um, at some point uh, the game no longer looked like history because all of these, these states in the game just became very static. You know, they, they just wouldn't change. You know, they wouldn't break apart. Uh, there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be ups and downs. Um, you know, there were, we often experimented with, with ways to work to kind of um, to change this. In Civ 3, we experimented with a Dark Ages uh, feature, and people just hated it. They hated the idea that you know we were arbitrarily saying that their civilization was going to go into decline, into decline for a certain period of time. Um, you know, we also uh, with Civ 4, we experimented with some bottom-up decision making, uh, giving some government types like a vassal states, decentralized government where you got certain bonuses, but you lost the ability to decide what your cities built or what your, uh, your uh, uh, scientists researched. Um, and it just, it just wasn't fun. People just didn't, the, the options were there and no one ever used it because people just fundamentally like making decisions. You know, I mean, it's, it's a tough problem. I mean, here, here's a simple way to put it. You know, this is, uh, this is Louis XVI. He would have really appreciated a revolution button. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, civilization is not scholarship, right? Um, you know, it's, it's a game, right? But, but can games be scholarship? Um, like, here's a question. This is, this is something I want as a game. I want ju Guns, Germs, and Steel, the game. Um, now, Guns, Germs, and Steel is a game that tries to answer a very big question about history. You know, fundamentally, like, why is it that uh, Western civilization, you know, eventually came, came to dominance? Um, and... You know, this is, this is the question the author is trying to answer at a high level. Um, why is it that, you know, the Incas weren't the ones who, you know, invented guns and, you know, sailed to, sailed to Spain and conquered Madrid? Why, did it, why was it the other way around? Because it's not like it was, it was close. Like, it was clear how things were going to develop. Um, and in Civ, you know, we often have world maps. And uh, if you play the Incas, you know, this is your starting position. You know, it's, it's not necessarily a great place to start. You're hemmed in by mountains. You've got just a whole bunch of jungle around you. Um, and moreover, um, this is your situation in the world. You know, there's a bunch of civilizations all throughout Eurasia, you know, going from Japan, China, through to India, you know, Persia, then to, to Europe where there's a whole bunch. Um, and I'll, I'll jump from this screen here to a chart from Guns, Germs, and Steel. And this is something called the major axes of the continents, which is a, a concept that Jared Diamond described in Guns, Germs, and Steel. And the point he was trying to make is that um, one of the important things that culture shared early on in civilization was crops, agriculture. And agriculture is something that can spread easily east to west because the climate tends to be the same, whereas north to south, it's not going to spread so easily. Something that works in cold climates is not going to work in warm climates and vice versa. And so all of the Eurasian sieves had an advantage that they were all on, you know, essentially the same, uh, same level, the same, same latitudes. Uh, whereas in the Americas, they didn't have that benefit, even though they had quite a bit of land mass. Um, and, you know, here's another problem. Uh, most of the most significant domesticated animals 
uh, sheep, goats, pigs, cows, horses. These are fundamental, fundamental drivers of the growth of civilization. All came from Eurasia. Uh, in fact, in the Americas, only the, the llama was really the only large-scale domestic animal that was available. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that, and he goes into it in his book. You know, everyone should read the book. It's a, it's a great, great book. Um, but the, the long and the short of it is, you know, <laughs> you know, the Incans are doomed. You know, they're, they're, there's no way they can, they can, they can win a game uh, where they, they can win under these situations. Uh, I shouldn't even say game. Um, because here's the thing, you know, geographic determinism, which is what Jared Diamond is talking about, uh, may be good scholarship, you know, but it's, it's bad game design. Um, and I, yeah, I read Guns, Germs, and Steel actually right before I started working on Civ 3, and it led to some notoriously bad ideas. Um, <laughs> like, one of the things we tried is we're like, okay, let's try to have continents without horses, right? Because that leads to some interesting situations, and that's the way it was in the real world. Players hated that. Uh, that, that didn't even make it into the release. Um, but many of the people who play Civ 3 uh, do often complain about bad resource distribution, that, uh, you know, they weren't, they, they, there wasn't enough iron near them. There weren't enough spices. There weren't enough, uh, you know, corn or whatever. Um, and, you know, that, you know, that I, we were trying to be, you know, we're trying to work in these elements from uh, works like uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. But, you know, at the end of the day, it just didn't make players happy. Um, so, you know, here's this big high-level question. Uh, you know, can, can Civ's mechanics, you know, actually match its theme? Um, can we make a game that is fun and also about world history in, in a meaningful way? Um, and I would probably say, you know, maybe not. Um, but, you know, I would also point out this is, this is probably also true for most other media. You know, I don't think there's a lot of great films about world history. Uh, there's not a lot of great, you know, paintings or music or, or whatever, really. I mean, you're pretty much stuck with books. You know, that's pretty much all there is. Um, instead, with games, I really think this is the way forward. What you want to do is you want to play a life. Put the, put the player in the shoes of someone who's, uh, who really existed, who had real tough choices to make in their life, real trade-offs to decide. Uh, Seven Seas of Gold, you play a conquistador. Railroad Tycoon, uh, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're a railroad mate magnet in the 19th century. Um, Here's a game that I made when I was uh, my senior year at, at Stanford. It was a game about being in, uh, a mercer in Oxford in the 16th, 17th century. Um, and I don't want to go into it too much, but I just want to point this out. You know, this was the, the theme and the meaning of this game was the same. Um, and uh, here is uh, a game that I, you know, I hope has probably come up some in the uh, serious game uh, community because I think it's, it's a wonderful example of a game that gets, gets getting your theme and meaning lined up right. Um, it's a game about gerrymandering, um, about, you know, drawing the lines of your congressional district to benefit your party. Um, and this is, this is a screen from uh, the press for the game that they, they released. Um, but this is a screen from a player, someone who actually played the game. And this is, you know, this is the crazy district that they drew up, you see, which is just spirals out, you know, ridiculously. This is the reason why people don't like uh, gerrymandering. And the thing that's interesting about this is this looks terrible, but does it really look that much terrible than this? <laughs> This is, this is the Illinois 4th District, and, you know, I mean, I, I don't need to say anything else. So, um, so here's the redistricting game. You know, the, the theme, the meaning, they're the same thing. Gerrymander your, way, your party into power. You know, this is, this is very, very important. And, you know, here's just kind of an important high-level point here, right? Art matters if the experience enlightens us. You know, I think that's something hopefully most of us can get behind. And furthermore, I'd say a game matters if the mechanics enlighten us. Right? That's, that's why we play games, especially serious games. And this is sort of the key to this lecture here. A game's theme only matters if the mechanics enlighten us about it. Right? The mechanics may still matter. The mechanics may still enlighten us about something, but the theme is it may be irrelevant. And there's a lot of games out there right now where the theme is irrelevant. And that's okay. But if you're trying to make a game about something, trying to make a game actually about its theme, you really have to think through do the mechanics enlighten you, enlighten the player about the theme? Um, now, have there been some mainstream successes where you know your theme is the same as the mechanics? Uh, there are. Um, there's sports games do this pretty well. Uh, you're in your Madden or your uh, you know your fantasy baseball games, uh, your football manager. Um, management games obviously are a great a great example of this. Uh, your railroad tycoon games, your SimCity games, uh, putting you in the role of you know a, a business person or a mayor. 
uh, tactile games are also an interesting area where you know this is this is really I think uh, seen some success where you're you're trying to you know in real life do the thing that you imagine you know the, the game's trying to display on screen. Uh, Dan Buttons uh, was an uh, important designer in the early games of uh, early days of video games and uh, really got this concept down right, especially with games like Mule and Semi Seas of Gold. Semi Seas of Gold was inspired when he got lost hiking in the Ozarks and was didn't know, you know didn't know where to go and and as he was trying to find his way back home he kind of imagined like oh this would make an interesting game what would be a good theme to match with it well what about the life of a conquistador these people really spent most of their time being lost um, so it was a game that was like, you know a perfect match of of theme and mechanics but here's the important thing all those games I went through really kind of were games that kind of focused on a lot of realism realism is not necessarily the, the key it can help because it keeps you focused on the topic but um, it's not necessarily the key. So here's, here's an interesting example. Gran Turismo versus Mario Kart. Um, you know, these are both racing games, um, but which one is more about racing? Um, here, are, here are the screenshots. You know, uh, for people who haven't played those few games, it's obvious one of them is a little more realistic than the other one. Um, but here's another question I have. Um, which one of these works I'm about to show is more about the bombing of Guernica? Is it this, this photograph? You know, which is stark. You know, look at those you know figures in the distance, the the whole you know the the ruined buildings, or is it is it this one? You know, which one of those is something that to you as the viewer feels more about what actually happened in Guernica, and to me, this is more about racing. Now, not everyone might agree, but to me, whereas a game where you know leads change, anyone can win, crazy stuff happens, that's what I envision racing to be about. Mario Kart is, you know, Mario Kart is a game that delivers that better um, because the mechanics have elements that make that work. You can, you know, throw shells at people, knock them off. You know, there, there's things that that you know punch the player in the lead. You know, there's all these interesting little mechanics that make the game very dynamic. Um, however, I also want to point out that theme really does still matter. Uh, here are two games that are actually very close. They're really kind of fundamentally about the same thing. They're about open world. Um, you know, your actions matter, uh, consequence, um, but they have very different themes. Grand Theft Auto, you're a bad guy. You know, in Crackdown, you're a cop. Um, and theme matters because the game, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto is sort of, you know, a, a national pariah, right? Um, it's a game that, you know, is a lot of people outside the industry look as, as what's the example of what's, what's wrong with video games. Um, now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't make those type of games, but if you care about those type of questions, you know, you want to, you want to remember that it's not, an, it's not inevitable that certain games have to be about certain things. You know, Grand Theft Auto didn't have to be about doing crime. You know, what it's really about is about, you know, an open world, doing, taking action, seeing what the consequences are. Uh, here's a quote from Raf Koster uh, from his excellent, bo excellent book, A Theory of Fun, where he talks about uh, a game he imagines about uh, dropping innocent Jews down uh, down a well into a gas chamber. As they fall to the bottom, they you know, form a you know, sort of a human pyramid trying to get to the top of the well. Um, and whereas if you pack them in tightly enough, the ones at the bottom die. Now, what is this game? Well, one way you could say is this game is is Tetris. Um, it's a game about you know packing people into the bottom. Um, and what he says is, I I do not want to play this game. Do you? Um, you know, it's it's a a good game design mechanic, but it's a repugnant pre premise. Um, and uh, the point he made, someone actually tried to, uh, well, someone actually did make this game, um, which uh, trans this is a uh, Brazilian game, and it translates essentially to Dungeon Tetris. Um, but even though they did this, they didn't actually, they still didn't tackle the topic of uh, Jews. Um, so what about Train? You know, this is, uh, this is a game by uh, Brenda Brothwaite, and um, it's, you know, another train game. It's another game about shipping cargo from point A to point B and trying to get uh, you know, the most from a point to another. Um, but the thing that makes this game unique is after you, after you play the game, after you see who delivers the most cargo and who wins the game, it's revealed what the ultimate destination is. And the ultimate destination is Austerlitz, uh, a death camp. And what you've been doing is you've been trying to deliver the most Jews to their death, you know, which is you know, a powerful moment for, you know, a lot of people as, as, they, as they play this game. Um, but I want to jump back for a second to um, Ticket to Ride. Um, 
because this is a game that had certain mechanics but also told you, you know, explicitly, okay, we, these are the mechanics, they do one thing. This is what the game is about, however. So, you know, if Ticket to Ride is not actually about train tra travel, you know, is train actually about the Holocaust? Um, similarly, is, is Dungeon Tetris really about torture? You know, can we actually make a game about the Holocaust? You know, is this, is this a topic that, you know, actually can lend itself to a game in a, in a fundamental way where the mechanics are actually about the Holocaust, the mechanics actually enlighten us? Um, now remember what I said earlier, for history at least, you know, play a life. Put the, put the player in the role of, a, of an actual character. Um, you know, but if we, if we play a life, you know, can we play evil? Can we get players to play evil in a way that they actually learn, you know, they, they learn something about it, it becomes a meaningful experience? Well, there is a game that I talked about today which, which does that exactly. You know, you know this, this is not sort of capital E, capital e evil, but gerrymandering is really bad. It's, it's a really bad thing for democracy. Um, and the redistricting game does a great job of showing, of putting you in the shoes of someone who's trying to, to carry out this bad act. Um, but ultimately, perhaps one of the problems with these, the Holocaust was not only was it evil, but it was also self-destructive. Um, you know, one of the great ironies of history is that most of the goals that Hitler cared about were not only not achieved, but the opposite happened. You know, Germany now has much smaller territory than it might have otherwise. It's a democratic country. He hated democracy. Uh, after World War II, he, hated, he also hated communism, and communism dominated that part of the world for a long time. Uh, there is now a Jewish state and has been for, so for a long time. Um, you know, a lot of these things that he wanted, due to the Holocaust, the opposite ended up happening. Um, so can you get someone to play at a game where their ultimate, their, their actions end up being self-destructive? Um, and, you know, this is a problem. You know, and for that reason, I think the Holocaust probably cannot be done as a, a realistically as a game. You know, we may end up having to do what you might call a Star Trek solution, which is you set a game in a, in a, in a, di a different world so you can tackle, you know, actual topics without sort of naming them. And I use Star Trek because um, in the 60s, you couldn't necessarily have, you know, a black woman and a white woman uh, in a relationship on, uh, on network television. But you could have... Captain Kirk be with an alien, for example. Um, and you could explore some of those issues, you know, without, you know, directly, but without having to, um, uh, you know, to show them explicitly. And there is actually uh, a fairly well-known uh, well series of games that did tackle issues like this, and that is the Ultimate series. Um, I don't want to jump too much into the details of the plots, but in, in, in Ultimate 5, uh, part of the goal of the game is to destroy the underworld. Uh, which is full of all of these creatures called gargoyles. Um, and, and, you know, they're your, your typical, typical monster in a role-playing game, you know, that, that try to kill you and you have to fight them off, and uh, they're one of the, your challenges in the game. And at the end of the game, you're trying to destroy their habitat. You're trying to destroy their world, essentially. Um, but when it comes to Ultima VI, suddenly the gargoyles start appearing in your world, and they start, um, uh, you know, causing problems for, for the human you know, for, for humanity. Um, but as the game progresses, uh, you realize that, you know, the gargoyles are not really fundamentally evil characters. They are simply people who lived, creatures who lived in the underworld. And the actions you took in Ultima V destroyed their world, so they had no choice but to fight back. So there's essentially this, this, this big change where you, reveal, you, you understand that, um, you know, to bring harmony to the world, the answer is not just to destroy all the gargoyles, it's to find... Uh, a peaceful solution for both you and them. Um, and that's, that's sort of the best example I think of that could tackle this problem. It's still, it's still I think, a big challenge, and, you know, well, you know, hopefully we can see what other people can do with this. Um, so, you know, we're almost at the end here, and I just want to make a, a couple of key points here at the end. You know, can games actually be a, about something? You know, just because you give a game a theme, just because you put a, a picture on a box, it doesn't actually make a game about that thing. Um, most importantly, you know, mechanics have to deliver on the theme's promise. You know, the mechanics are the meaning. And most importantly, a game's theme only matters if the mechanics enlighten us about it. And that's it.
Okay, we have uh, about five or ten minutes for questions. There is a microphone in the center of the room. If you have a question, if you p- please uh, come to the mic so we can get it on the recording. Is this on? That was just great, Soren. I I was wondering, one of my favorite moments of matching theme and gameplay was in the single-player campaign in Warcraft 3 where you're a good character who has to kill uh, zombies in a city, but they're they're actually humans that are going to turn into zombies, and it's much easier to kill them as humans before they turn into zombies. Uh, Have you played that uh, scenario? Uh, I don't remember that one, uh, right. but that sounds like an interesting example. I, I just bring it up as something where it lines up the emotional impact of a character who supposedly thinks of himself as good but is essentially turning evil through pretty uh, logical ways. And, you know, I, I do, can you say anything about other sort of... Uh, you, you did a great job with, with the, the um, train and the... the uh, Holocaust stuff. Are there other mainstream games you can think about that have kind of gotten that emotional gut reaction out of people by lining up the mechanics and the, the storyline that way? Uh, so the question is, um, are there other games out there that are able to put you in a place where you do something that you know you might you might discover is might discover is evil or you know something that makes you queasy, so makes you do something that you you don't want to do. Um, I mean, a lot of RTSs have this problem because they want you to play each one of the races, and there's often, you know, sort of the evil race. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think both StarCraft and WarCraft have some good examples of that. Um, I don't think there's any great example I can think of offhand. Otherwise, I probably would have <laughs> put it in the lecture. So, but thanks. Good. Um, I just had a, 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 I guess a clarification question about how, for example, the mechanics of train doesn't match with the theme of trains. If the theme is something, for example, like the banality of evil or the uh, you know, role of, uh, say, even to take it as like a character-driven thing or the role of the administrative people who would make such an event like that possible. So the question is, how, did the, how does the theme and the mechanics of... Yeah, how do, they, how do they not match? How do the theme and the mechanics of train not match yeah. um, in terms of... The, or or the, like, how do the mechanics not enlighten the theme, if you interpret the theme as being something along those lines. Right. Well, um, actually, I think they, they, actually, I think they do in some ways, right? I think they do actually really hit on that point, the banal- banality of evil, of what it's like to be an uh, administrator where, you know, you're not really thinking about whether you're, you're moving people or you're moving cattle or you're moving widgets or whatever. Um, I guess I was trying to make a larger point about um, what would it mean to make a game that was truly about the Holocaust, you know, like... I think that there's, there's always a bit of a problem in a game like Train where when you're playing the games, the mechanics make you think you're doing one thing, and then suddenly it says, oh, you're, you know, you're not really doing that thing. Um, that, is, that is the point of the game, right? It's like kind of a one-off game about that. You know? I mean, I think Train is going to be kind of like one of, those, one of those pieces of art like you know, John Cage's Three and a Half Minutes of Silence that you know, someone got to make. But, you know, we can't just keep making games like this. So it's an important work, but, um, you know, it perhaps is not... Uh, it's a great example. It's maybe not really a good direction to develop other games like. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I, I just, and just to as a follow-up on that, I think that there's, a, there's a, a point that the transition between meaning and mechanics is actually important in that game. So once you do realize what you're doing, whether or not you continue playing is actually a part of that game. Um, and also right. just to, to take something like the Holocaust and make that a totality where you only actually can address, it ha- you know, you have to have one grand thing that addresses everything about it um, is maybe also not the, ri- the right approach. I mean, it's an approach you take with, like, these big civilization games, but uh, when you're talking about your example of the merchant, of playing the life of the merchant, that's a very small, you know, you're not, you're not playing a game about all of commerce in that time period. You're playing a very small piece of it, which enlightens, you know, kind of, that idea in small chunks at a time. Right. Yeah. yeah. You've presented some great dichotomies for a designer to want to develop a game. Um, now, you use the word meaning. I applaud your, your using of that rather than fun or whatever, because you usually think of meaning falling into the theme. 
Right. Actually, it falls, and I'm, from my viewpoint, it falls. In, it's usually used to associate with content. Uh, and then the content has relationship to the player. Now, all of a sudden, it sounds as if you're specifying the kind of player that's going to want to play the game, which means that you're really talking about, are, is it, you're talking about a designer who is designing for a particular subset of serious players. Um, so the question is, uh, could you... Sorry, um, is trying to tie the meaning, like the, the meaning to whom? If you're a designer, you're designing mechanics for a particular who to right. play the game, which is, are you narrowing the subset of players who are going to want to play that game? Or do you have a real target type? As, as opposed to a serious gamer. Like, everybody's not going to want to play Civ, and not, everyone's not going to play the uh, redistricting game. Right. So how do you, how do you resolve this... Mechanic, mechanics of just play for everybody, or is this play for meaning for specific people? Um, so the question is, are, do, I, do I want to narrow down the audience specifically yeah. to um, make a game meaningful, I suppose? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't think of that as a designer. I mean, when I, make, when I design a game, I definitely know that there is a specific target audience that I, I am aiming for, but my hope is certainly anyone can play it. Um, I think that there will become the... I think fun is an interesting is interesting point because I think to some extent every game does need to be fun and it does need to compel people to play, um, but I hope that we can get to a point where compel doesn't just mean entertain yeah, or or enjoy. With the meaning would right. be great. Yeah, um, and I think we're just at the cusp of that. Like I that's agree. just beginning. I appreciate. So. I applaud your moving us a step closer. Thank you. So you spoke about. Um, the concepts of mechanics and of theme. Uh, I was wondering what you think of the idea of type, how long a game takes, how many players there are, uh, is it played on a large board, a small board, and uh, does that impact it? And I guess the example I would think of is the original Civilization board game, uh, which took hours and hours to play, and part of the goal of that, I, I read, was that they wanted to impart that this took a lot of time to happen. Right. It wasn't, if you played it for an hour, you wouldn't get that civilization moves very slowly. Uh, do you feel that is uh, more similar to mechanics or to theme in terms of that? So the question is, how important is play format? The number of people who play, um, the length of the game? I mean, I think it is, it is very important, especially for the theme of a lot of people. When we released Civ 4, we actually had to add in an extra... Um, game option to allow people to extend the game because we kind of we kind of shortened and simplified a lot of the dynamics in Civ 4, and a lot of people just felt like the game was flying by too fast. It didn't it didn't match their concept of like how epic epic of a game they're they're supposed to be playing. Um, I, I don't know if I have any you know great suggestions on that, but I mean I think it's it's definitely equally as important an issue. Um, I also would also want to bring up the question of single player versus multiplayer. You know I think there's some topics you can only really uh, address in single player. Um, I think it's in some senses every multiplayer game is the same because you're playing with, you're playing with people and you're always playing with this, the same meta game you know I want to beat this person and I want to not let this person win and I want to do this and that and, and so on um, and I think single player games are I think always going to be a real a core part of trying to get a, uh, get people to engage with a, a serious uh, serious issue. All right, thank I know you. there's I know there's a couple more questions I think we have to we have to stop now unfortunately okay. uh, it, just a reminder please fill out your your evaluations uh, before you leave let's g give a round of applause to Soren <laughs> it's uh, it's lunch now we're back here at uh, 145 145 145 145 145 145 145